NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden, thank you for joining us. How does MAVEN fit into NASA's big picture for Mars missions? Yeah. When you look at our exploration strategy, everything is focused on getting humans on the surface of Mars in the 2030s, as the president's challenged us to do. And But along the way, there are a number of robotic precursors. There is an asteroid redirect mission that's going to allow us to learn a little bit more about our solar system by studying an asteroid and also demonstrate some of the techniques that we'll need when we get to Mars. Uh, but MAVEN is going to be a, a mission that we've never done before because it's going to be one focused on Mars's upper atmosphere. And it's going to allow scientists like Bruce Joukowsky and his team to look uh, over time at what's happening to the upper atmosphere of Mars. How is it evaporating away or how is it being brushed away or scraped away by the solar winds so that they can go backwards in time and figure out what was it like uh, in what you would call quote-unquote prehistoric times on Mars, when Mars was a fertile planet much like our Earth today. Uh, that also transfers to us here on Earth because the things that have happened to Mars over time could very well happen to, to planet Earth. So that's the role that MAVEN plays. It's our first opportunity to look with great scientific detail into the upper atmosphere and what's happening to it. Beyond commercial crew, which we all know about, what role do you mm -hmm. see for the commercial sector as NASA ventures beyond low Earth orbit, and how does the COTS model fit that? Well, we are tweaking things from lessons learned from COTS uh, even as we speak. We're trying to, because you, you probably are very much aware, we've gone through CCDEV, which was a commercial crew development program into uh, commercial crew implementation program into a, a program called CPC where we actually ask the providers to give us their under contract to tell us how they will comply with the requirements that we've laid out, how they'll make sure that these vehicles are going to be as safe as or safer than the space shuttle because that's that's one of the mandates on the commercial crew program and that's one of the things that I've dedicated myself to. Uh, no matter what anybody says, it's got to be as safe as or safer than shuttle and that's very important. So. Uh, the commercial in, in, providers have demonstrated very well through COTS and now CRS that they can, in fact, take over from the government the provision of cargo to, to space. We're hoping that very soon they'll demonstrate that they can take over the, the duties of carrying crew to low Earth orbit. And what will follow on to our missions, uh, if you look at, at the mission to uh, redirect an asteroid, if we're successful in that mission, that will open up the possibility that commercial interests, whether they be academic or, or business or whatever, can follow on behind us and actually get to asteroids for purposes of mining or study or whatever you have it. And then eventually at some time, uh, you know, it, is, it has always been a hope that humans would inhabit Mars, will inhabit the moon. Uh, we're already working with companies uh, under Space Act agreements to try to facilitate uh, their plans to put habitats on the surface of the moon. We're talking to people about putting habitats on the surface of Mars. Those are all long-range goals, but, but they are things that NASA is working with the outside world on already. Another, another round of sequestration is coming on January 1st. What impact do you see to NASA's strategic programs? Yeah, yeah. If, if sequester hits, it'll be the 15th of January, and, and it will be devastating to us. It, uh, no, I, I, you know, there's no sugarcoating it. NASA's budget uh, it's just math. Uh, it goes from where we are today at about 16.8 billion down to roughly 16.1. And what it will mean, unfortunately, is that some of the some of the major programs that we have in place right now that we've been nursing along will have to go away. Uh, we probably will have to take a look at some of the uh, the priorities agreed to by the president and the Congress, and uh, and one of them may have to go away. And that would not be a good day for the U.S. So. My hope is that Congress and the administration will work diligently to see that sequester, uh, they figure out a way to, to get the budget, to get, the, get our, our debt down and get a budget in place without depending on sequester again. Those will be JWST, SLS Orion, yeah. and Space Station commercial crew? Th that's correct. That's correct. You said go away? Go away means with without funding, they go away. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you can do certain things, but after you can always stretch a program out, um, and that's generally the way that that we like to do it in the U.S. Um, it's very inefficient to do it that way because in the long run, you don't save any money. It costs you more. Um, it's it's a very inefficient way to do plans, and and we don't we don't really want to do that. 
Uh, James Webb is well on its way to its 2018 mission. So, so you know, ideally, you would hope that you don't have to do anything to, to jeopardize James Webb. But, but programs like uh, the heavy lift launch vehicle and Orion um, are in the early stages of their development. And, and Sequester could very well put, put portions of that at risk. Uh, they could put the commercial crew program at risk. And, and we just, the nation cannot tolerate that right now. So it, you know, I, we need to be serious about the impact that Sequester has. And we need to say, okay, if the nation really wants to do what the Congress and the administration tell NASA to do, uh, you've got to provide sustained funding for that. And Sequester does not play in the sustained funding piece of the equation. You crawled into Orion yesterday. What were your impressions of that? <laughs> I did. It was, it was awesome, you know, to, to, to be able to get into a spacecraft, even though this is not the, the spacecraft being configured for our first human flight, uh, it is still Orion, the, 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 it's the predecessor for that vehicle. And it was just incredible to be able to go into the hatch and, and kind of lay on my back there as if we were, it was launch morning and, and imagine what, the, what all the controls and displays will look like and, and imagine talking to your fellow crew members as you, know, you laugh and joke and scratch waiting for the ground team to make sure that everything's okay so you can go launch. So uh, it, it was very, very, very exciting for me personally. I hope it was exciting to the, you know, to the team working on Orion, the fact that, that we're all interested in what they're doing. We believe in them, and we have confidence that they can, they can make this thing work. How roomy is that compared to, say, a space shuttle flight deck? Uh, nothing is, is, is as roomy as shuttle. I have to explain to people, shuttle was an enig was a, was a, it, it's just different from anything else. Uh, but there's plenty of room inside Orion. You know, we, we expect that we can get a crew of seven in there plus some cargo. Uh, and you've got to remember, a shuttle was built to live in. Uh, Orion is built as a transportation mechanism for deep space exploration. Granted, it's a lot longer mission than, say, transportation to the International Space Station or somewhere. But we'll also have the service module that the Europeans are going to provide. So that'll give us some additional living space. I, I think it will, be, it will be very comfortable for a crew that's, that's on its way to an asteroid or on its way to Mars when, when we get to that point. Administrator Bolden, thank you for joining us. No, thank you.